Hello, everybody, and welcome to the afternoon seminar. Today's seminar is with Dr. Bruce and Leslie Fife. Dr. Bruce is actually the president of the Coconut Research Center, whose purpose is to educate healthcare professionals and the public all about the positive nutritional aspects of coconut. Our coconut doctor has written over 35 books on health. Some of these include the Coconut Oil Miracle, Coconut Cures, Oil Pulling Therapy, and the Coconut Water for Health and Healing, and Stop Alzheimer's Now. Dr. Fife is an author, he's a speaker, he's a certified nutritionist, and a naturopath, and the most knowledgeable teacher in the world about coconut. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Bruce Fife. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today and share with you a little bit about what I know about the amazing coconut. I love to talk about coconut. I've been writing and lecturing about the benefits of coconut for many years, and I still get excited when I talk about it. And I get excited because coconut is an amazing food. So coconut is really a superfood. It is classified as a functional food. And a functional food is a food that provides health benefits that go above and beyond its nutritional or its vitamin and mineral content. And coconut oil particularly is very beneficial. And it has the potential to help you with a wide variety of health conditions ranging from acne to Alzheimer's. Now let me tell you a little bit how I got interested in coconut. I didn't grow up where there's lots of coconuts. I didn't grow up eating coconuts. I rarely ever ate coconut as a kid. The only thing I knew about coconut is what I learned in school in my nutritional classes. And there, I learned that coconut contained saturated fat. So coconut oil had a lot of saturated fat in it. And at that time, saturated fat was considered unhealthy because it was believed to promote heart disease. And so that was my thinking, that coconut oil was one of the unhealthy fats. Well, some years ago, I was in a meeting with a group of nutritionists, and one of the members of the group stated that coconut oil was one of the good fats that did not cause heart disease, had many health benefits, and I was totally shocked. I'd never heard this before, but this, this nutritionist, she backed up her statement. He, she cited several studies that showed benefits to coconut oil. I learned that coconut oil in one form or another was often used in IV solutions in hospitals. In hospitals, you know, they stick the IV in your arm, that sometimes they had coconut oil going straight into your vein. They also used it in some of the feeding tube formulas for sick patients. They also used it in hospital uh, infant formulas. In fact, every commercial infant formula contained coconut oil. Coconut oil was also used in over-the-counter anti-candida medications. It was recommended for people who had digestive problems, people with gallbladder disease, cystic fibrosis. Uh, it was extensively used in the sports and fitness industry. And when I learned all this, I said, wow, you know, if coconut oil has all these nutritional and medical uses, why are people saying it's unhealthy? And I had to find the answer. And I wanted to go where I could find facts. So I didn't want to read magazine articles or books with people's opinions on it. I wanted to go to cold, hard scientific facts. So I went to the medical literature and started looking up studies that researchers have done on coconut oil to find out what's the truth behind coconut oil. And that's what I did. And I found hundreds of studies on coconut oil. And I started reading them. And as I was reading through them, I was shocked. I was shocked at what I found. I found why coconut oil, in one form or another, was used to treat sick patients in the hospital. I found out why it was included in baby formula. 
I found out why it was used in over-the-counter anti-candida medications. I found out why it was used in the sports and fitness industry. I also learned that coconut oil had lots of other health benefits. And I couldn't find anything negative about coconut oil. Everything was positive. The only negative stuff that I could find is when they took the oil and they hydrogenated it. They chemically altered it. Well, all hydrogenated oils are unhealthy. And so that made sense. But natural coconut oil, the type that you buy in the store, there wasn't anything wrong with it. In my research, I found that coconut oil had a long history of use as a food and as a medicine. In, uh, it holds a high place of respect in Ayurvedic medicine of India. In China, next. In China, there are ancient medical textbooks going back 2,000 years that describe the use of coconut in treating and curing at least 69 diseases. In Central America and East Africa, a tradition that they've used for generations is when they've come down with an illness, the first thing they do is drink a cup of coconut oil. In the islands of the Pacific, coconut oil is considered the cure to all illness. Next. The coconut palm, next, the coconut palm is so highly regarded, it is called the tree of life. In traditional forms of medicine around the world, coconut oil has been used for a wide variety of conditions. Next, to treat everything from burns and constipation to influenza and mononucleosis. Modern medical science is now confirming the use of coconut oil for many of these conditions. I began using it myself and recommending it to others. I've seen it clear up hemorrhoids, stop bladder infections, remove cancerous lesions, skin lesions, uh, restore thyroid health to people, help people lose excess weight, and many, many other things. And after learning all this, I realized that few people outside of the research community knew about the healing miracles of coconut oil. I felt an obligation to share this knowledge with others. Next. And so I wrote the book, The Coconut Oil Miracle. And everything in this book is derived from published medical studies, the historical record, and my own experience with coconut oil. So what's the secret? What makes coconut oil so good? What makes it different from every other oil out there? Well, the difference is in the fat molecule. All fats and oils are composed of fat molecules known as fatty acids. And you've got different types of fatty acids. Next. And you can classify these fatty acids into three general categories depending on their size or the length of their carbon chain. So you've got long chain fatty acids, medium chain fatty acids, and short chain fatty acids. Now the vast majority of the fats that you eat every day, whether they're uh, from an animal or from a plant, from um, they're saturated or unsaturated, the vast majority are long chain fatty acids. In fact, I would say 95 to 100 percent of the fats you eat daily consist of long chain fatty acids. Unless you eat a lot of coconut or coconut oil, because coconut oil is composed predominantly of medium chain fatty acids. And this is important because our bodies respond to and process each fat differently depending on its size. So the physiological effects of the uh, medium chain fatty acids of coconut oil are very different from those of the long chain fatty acids we normally get in our diet. And since the 1950s, researchers have found that uh, coconut oil or the medium chain fatty acids in coconut oil provide numerous nutritional and medical benefits. That's why they're used in hospital to hospitals to treat critically ill patients, to treat uh, infants, and for other conditions. Now, next, 
Whenever I start talking about coconut oil, one of the um, first, some of the first questions I get is, won't that raise my cholesterol? Won't that, and won't that promote heart disease? My answer to them is, no, it will not. When someone starts adding coconut oil into their diet, their total cholesterol, their total cholesterol may increase a little bit or it may decrease a little bit. But it depends, it's different for everyone and it really doesn't matter. But in every case, what's going to happen is that your HDL cholesterol, your so-called good cholesterol, will increase. HDL cholesterol is believed to protect against heart disease. And the higher your HDL, the better, the more protective it is. In fact, one of the reasons why when people start adding coconut oil into their diet, that's why their total cholesterol comes up is because they're producing more HDL good cholesterol. Now, total cholesterol is really uh, pretty useless in uh, judging heart disease risk. And why is that? It's because total cholesterol contains both HDL cholesterol and the LDL, or so-called bad cholesterol. And you don't know how much makes up the total. And so a much better indicator of heart disease risk is the cholesterol ratio. Now, 50% of the people that go into or have heart attacks have normal to below normal um, cholesterol values. And that's why total cholesterol isn't a very good indicator. But the cholesterol ratio is a much better value. And doctors usually rely on this uh, as a better value. Now, researchers have measured people's cholesterol values after they've been eating different types of oils for a period of time. And what they've found is that polyunsaturated vegetable oils, that's like corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, peanut oil, these type of oils, polyunsaturated vegetable oils, after you've eaten those, your total cholesterol uh, comes down. It lowers total cholesterol better than coconut oil does. Now, initially, this was interpreted to mean that polyunsaturated uh, fats help reduce risk of heart disease while coconut oil doesn't. However, when the research started, researchers started to measure HDL cholesterol and calculating the cholesterol ratio, what they found is that coconut oil reduces the cholesterol ratio and therefore the risk of heart disease better than any other fat. So if you're going by cholesterol values, coconut oil protects against heart disease better than any other fat in the diet. Now, if coconut oil really did promote heart disease, if it really was bad, it would be very easy to prove that. And how would you do that? Basically, all you'd need to do is go to the coconut growing regions of the world where people eat lots and lots of coconut oil and examine the health there. If it was unhealthy, you would find high rates of heart disease and stroke. Well, this research has been done. Lots of it has been done. And what they've found uh, is that next is that those people that eat a lot of coconut have low rates of heart disease. In fact, those that eat the most coconut oil have the lowest rates of heart disease in the world. So when you start looking at the evidence, you'll see that coconut oil does not promote heart disease. The evidence indicates that it protects against it. Next, one of the unique features about coconut oil is how it is processed by the body, how it's digested, digested and metabolized. It's digested completely different from other oils, which makes it unique. Let me briefly explain how digestion of long-chain uh, fatty acids or long-chain triglycerides are accomplished. 
When you eat an oil consisting of the long chain triglycerides or fatty acids, the oil passes through your stomach pretty much intact and into your, your intestinal tract. And it's in the intestinal tract where the vast majority of fat digestion occur, occurs. Here, you have pancreatic digestive enzymes and bile that work on the fat, breaking it down into individual long-chain fatty acids. And these long-chain fatty acids are then absorbed into the intestinal wall where they're repackaged into little bundles of fat and protein called lipoproteins. Then these lipoproteins are sent into the bloodstream and they circulate in your bloodstream. And as they're circulating, particles of fat are being released. And this is the source of the fat that collects in your fat cells or eventually will end up around your stomach or on your thighs. Now, when you eat coconut oil, the process is completely different. When you eat an oil that's composed predominantly of the medium-chain fatty acids or medium-chain triglycerides, it too will pass through your stomach into your intestinal tract. But by the time it leaves the stomach, it's already broken down. It's already broken down into medium-chain fatty acids. So it doesn't need any more digestion. It doesn't need pancreatic digestive enzymes. It doesn't need bile. This is one of the reasons why coconut oil is recommended for people with digestive problems, people with gallbladder problems, or other uh, fat digestive problems. They can handle coconut oil while they can't handle other fats. Now, because it comes out of the stomach already digested, it's immediately absorbed into the portal vein and sent to the liver. And when it goes to the liver, the liver looks at it and says, ah, this is energy, and it starts burning it as fuel. And so it bypasses the lipoprotein stage in the intestinal wall. So it doesn't provide the fat that collects in our fat cells. It provides energy. Next. And so when you eat coconut oil, you get a boost of energy. Now, it's not like the kick or the buzz you get from caffeine, but you get, uh, your mind becomes more alert, more clear. You have more energy. You can accomplish more. It's a better high than coffee. During the middle of the day, you know, and we often kind of get drowsy, kind of like right now, you know, instead of having a coffee break, you can take a spoonful of coconut oil, and it'll give you that boost It'll be a healthy boost to get you throughout the day. This is one of the reasons why it's used in the sports and fitness industry. Athletes, those that are very physically active, like to include it into their diets to give them that edge, that boost of energy. It's often used in uh, protein bars and energy bars and protein shakes because they want that added energy that they get from coconut oil. Next, one of the interesting benefits, no, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, one of the interesting benefits with coconut is that it can help you lose excess weight. Now, people kind of shock, what? It's a fat, isn't it? How can you use fat to lose fat? Yeah. You can use fat to lose fat, particularly with coconut oil. And there's five major reasons why coconut oil can help you lose excess body fat. One of them, we kind of mentioned before, is that when you eat coconut oil, it's not supplying fat that's going to be sucked into your fat cells. So it's not supplying fat. The second reason is that the energy that you get from coconut oil actually makes you more physically active so that you actually burn off more calories. Third is that coconut oil actually has fewer calories than other fats. So if you replaced all the fats in your diet with coconut oil, you would be consuming fewer calories, so there'd be fewer calories to be converted into body fat. Fourth, and this is a... a, a really important one, is that coconut oil has an amazing ability to satisfy hunger. So if you just added coconut oil to a meal, it would satisfy your hunger sooner, so you don't eat as much. It would satisfy your hunger longer, 
so you don't feel hungry between meals, so you don't have the tendency to snack. It also helps curb sugar cravings, so you don't want to have that candy bar during the middle of the day. And at, at the next meal, you're not so hungry that you overeat. So if you eat coconut oil or add coconut oil early on to the, in the day, at the end of the day, you'll actually end up consuming fewer calories. And you'll do it without feeling deprived because you'll do it by choice because you're just not hungry. You don't eat as much. Now, the fifth reason, and probably the most important reason why coconut oil can aid in weight loss is that when you eat it, as I've mentioned, it's converted into energy. It boosts your energy. And in this process, it kicks your metabolism up into a higher level. And so you're burning af off calories at an accelerated rate. And so there are fewer calories left over to be converted into body fat. Studies have shown that in normal weight individuals, after a meal, one meal with coconut oil, metabolism increases by an amazing 48%. So your metabolism is burning off 48% more calories if you add coconut oil into your food. Think of that, 48% is almost 50%. So if you had a, a plate of food and you add coconut oil to it, half of those calories are going to disappear because your metabolism will increase and burn them all off. You still get to enjoy the full plate of food and all those calories, but half of them are going to be burned off, essentially. Now, it gets even better. In overweight people, people that really need to lose the weight, metabolism increases by 65%. So the more overweight a person is, the more effect, more metabolism, your higher goes by using coconut oil, which means you burn off more calories. Now, this metabolic stimulating effect doesn't just occur for an hour or two after eating a meal. Research has shown that after one meal, consuming coconut oil, your metabolism is elevated and remains elevated for a full 24 hours. So for 24 hours after one meal, you're burning off calories at an accelerated rate, losing all that excess fat. Isn't that a remarkable health food? Weight loss aid? Now, researchers at McGill University in Canada have calculated that if you replaced all of the fats that you're typically eating right now that consist of long-chain fatty acids with a fat that consists of medium-chain fatty acids, you could lose up to 36 pounds a year. This is without changing your diet. This is without reducing the amount you eat or changing the type of foods you eat. You can lose up to 36 pounds a year simply by getting an oil change. <laughs> Next. Next. Frankly, low-fat diets don't work. You go to the store, you have a wide variety of choices of non-fat foods, low-fat foods, hundreds of them there. In fact, over the past 30 years, we've been on a low-fat trend. We eat less fat now than ever before. In fact, over the past 30 years, our fat consumption has decreased by about 15%. And what has it gotten us? Fatter. We're fatter now than ever before. 60% of Americans are overweight. 30% are obese. Even our children are now overweight. The truth is you need fat to lose fat, particularly if the fat you choose is coconut oil. Next. When you go, according to the Mayo Clinic, 95% of those the people who go on low-fat, calorie-restricted diets regain all their weight within five years. That's a 95% failure rate. 
If you knew that the diet you were going on to lose weight was going to, had a 95% chance of failure, would you want to go on it? All low-fat diets are like that. The only, the 5% people who are able to keep that weight off generally are people who are also very physically active, and so they work out a couple hours a day to keep that weight lost. So, um, when you go on a low-calorie diet, what happens is your body is going to interpret this as a famine. And because you're in a famine, the body shifts its metabolism into low gear as a survival mechanism. Because if your metabolism is lower, you can survive longer on less calories and fewer nutrients. Hopefully, you'll survive long enough until the famine is over. Now, there's a problem. Right now, in your normal day-to-day -day life, your calorie consumption is somewhere here, and your um, you know, metabolism matches that. Whatever you're eating, you're, you're matching it. When you go on a low-fat, calorie-restricted diet, and you start cutting back on your calories, then you're going to start losing weight because your metabolism is still elevated. But your body is going to shift into survival mode and pull down your metabolism. So the first few weeks, you're going to lose weight. But as your metabolism comes down and matches your food consumption, you're going to stop losing weight. So what you have to do is you're going to have to reduce your food intake. Well, you'll start losing weight again, and, but your metabolism is going to follow right after that. And then it's going to match. You're going to stop losing weight. So to lose more weight, you're going to have to cut down even more on what you eat. And again, your metabolism is going to come down. Eventually, you're going to come to a point where you're going to end your diet and you're going to start eating more because you can't continue down here or you'll starve to death because most low-fat, low-calorie diets are starvation diets. So you're going to start eating more. Well, the problem is your metabolism is still stuck down here and you've got all these calories. What's going to happen to those calories? They're going to be converted into body fat. And so you're going to eat, 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 and your metabolism is going to lag behind until you're back up here, your calorie con consumption is back where it was before, and your metabolism is going to lag, lag, and lag. And all this time, you're gaining weight, gaining weight. By the time your metabolism catches up, you've regained all the weight you lost, plus you've added on several extra pounds. Next. This is called diet-induced obesity. And this is what happens to all of us. This is a natural instinct for our bodies, a survival instinct of our bodies. All of our bodies do this. When we cut down on our fat and our calories, metabolism is going to come down. And so we gain weight, or we become obese by dieting. Now, if you add fat into your diet, if you add a good portion of fat into a calorie-restricted diet, you can reverse this. When you add fat in your diet, your body interprets this as food is abundant, the hunting is good, this is not a famine, you're okay. And so your metabolism, your calorie content, your metabolism up here, you cut down on your calories, your metabolism stays high because you're not in a famine. Your body doesn't interpret it as a famine. You're eating enough fat. Your body thinks things are good. And so all you have to do is just cut down on calories just a little bit, and you start losing weight, and you continue to lose it, and you continue to lose it, and continue to lose it. Your metabolism remains elevated. And you don't have to keep lowering your food content. Just 100 calories a day. You'll be losing weight, and you'll continue to lose it for months and months and months until you've reached your goal weight. And then when you're through, you eat more, and you match up, and you're not going to gain weight. You just stop losing weight. What's better than that? Now, there's an added benefit to adding coconut oil into your diet, your daily diet. Many people are plagued with low 
thyroid function. Lots of times the weight problems are caused by low thyroid function. Well, when you start adding coconut oil regularly into your diet, what you need to do is go see your doctor and check with him because he's going to probably reduce your thyroid medication and maybe even take you totally off of it because the, the coconut oil will restore your thyroid function. That's because it's boosting your metabolism. It also boosts the metabolism of your thyroid gland and basically kickstart it so it runs on its own properly as it should be running. Now, some people respond to coconut oil, just adding coconut oil to their diet, they start losing weight right and left. I had lots of people, when I initially wrote my book, and they would contact me and say, oh, I lost 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds. But not everyone's going to lose weight just by adding coconut oil into the diet. Next. So I've written a book that describes exactly how you can incorporate coconut oil into the best diet that you can to lose the most weight you can um, and to super boost your metabolism, restore thyroid function. You can lose this weight and you can lose it without hunger. An amazing, amazing thing. Now, next, one of the most amazing aspects about medium chain fatty acids and coconut oil is their ability to prevent and even cure infectious illnesses. Next. Years ago, it was discovered that human breast milk contained medium chain fatty acids and that these medium chain fatty acids possess very potent antimicrobial properties capable of killing disease-causing bacteria, viruses, and fungi. In fact, it's due primarily to the medium chain fatty acids in human breast milk that protects newborn infants from infections for the first few months of their lives while their immune systems are still developing. The medium chain fatty acids in coconut oil, next, possess the same antimicrobial properties as those in human breast milk. They're identical. And research has shown that medium chain fatty acids from coconut oil can kill bacteria that cause things like sinus infections, ear infections, throat infections, um, gonorrhea, pneumonia, urinary tract infections. They kill yeast and fungi next that cause ringworm, athlete's foot, candida infections. Next, they kill viruses that cause influenza, measles, herpes, mononucleosis, hepatitis C. They even kill HIV, the AIDS virus. Research has shown that when a medium chain fatty acid comes in contact with HIV virus, it kills the virus. This has also been demonstrated clinically. For example, there was a study in the Philippines in which they had a group of HIV infected uh, patients and they gave them the equivalent of three and a half tablespoons of coconut oil a day. They received no other form of medication, no other form of treatment, just the coconut oil. After three months, 60% of the patients were showing improvement. They had lower viral loads. They were eating more. They were regaining their weight. They were feeling better. This study proved that coconut oil taken orally had a very potent antiviral effect and could be used for the treatment of AIDS and other uh, virus-type infections. In 2005, next, my wife and I were invited to uh, go to the Philippines and speak at a coconut conference. And we met a man there who was an AIDS survivor. He used coconut oil therapy to overcome the disease. His name's Tony. This is him in the middle. And he had acquired HIV when he worked in Saudi Arabia. And he'd come home to the Philippines where he was diagnosed with full-blown AIDS. And he, 
Tony was in horrible condition. He was racked with many secondary infections. He had pneumonia. Uh, he had chronic fatigue syndrome. He had um, oral candida infection. He had a constant fever and a persistent cough. He had skin infections from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. His hair was falling out in clumps. Uh, he wore a wig to hide the bald spots on his head. The doctors told him that he only had a few months to live. And since he was so sick, he couldn't afford to buy any medications. So he asked uh, the government for help. And they referred him to one of the doctors that had worked on the HIV study I mentioned a, mo a moment ago. And this doctor had him consume six tablespoons of coconut oil every day. He also had him put coconut oil on all of the sores, the infections all over his body. And so he started doing that every day. And every month or two, he went back to the clinic for a checkup. And every time he went back, the medical staff was amazed at his improvement. He was improving far more with coconut oil than he had ever done with the antivirals he had, had been using. Well, when we went to the Philippines and met him, this, he was on the, the therapy for about eight and a half, nine months by that point. And when we met him, all of his secondary infections were cured. His skin had cleared up. His hair had grown back. His energy levels were back. In fact, he was one of the featured speakers at the conference. He was feeling that good. You couldn't tell by looking at him that just a few months earlier, he was literally on his deathbed dying from AIDS. Now, he may never be totally free of the HIV virus, but he was totally free of all these secondary infections, and his energy levels were back to normal. He was living a normal life. Now, I need to point out that coconut oil, um, or the medium chain fatty acids in coconut oil can kill a lot of different viruses and bacteria, but they won't kill every virus and bacteria. So you can't use it to treat every type of infectious condition, but that's a good thing. Why is that a good thing? Well, there's some bacteria we don't want to kill, namely friendly gut bacteria, which are essential for good digestive function. Coconut oil does not harm friendly gut bacteria. It kills the candida. It kills the harmful bacteria, but leaves the good bacteria alone. This is another reason why it's recommended for people with digestive problems, because it helps rebalance the microflora in your digestive tract, getting rid of the bad guys, improving the good guys. Next, now coconut oil can also help with non-infectious illnesses. One of them is cancer. Coconut oil possesses very potent anti-cancer properties. Next, for example, in one study, uh, researchers chemically induced colon cancer in animals. And in these animals, they uh, gave them a diet that had different types of oils. And they did this to see what effect the different oils might have on the growth and the development of the tumors. And so the type of oils they used was like olive oil, canola oil, soybean oil, corn oil, coconut oil, things like that. All of the animals in the study developed colon cancer, except those given coconut oil. Coconut oil completely blocked the formation of the cancer. There have been several studies that have suggested that coconut oil can protect against breast cancer. For example, in one study, researchers chemically induced mammary cancer in test animals. Like the study I mentioned before, they also gave them different oils in their diet to see what effect these oils might have on the development of breast cancer. All of the animals in the study developed mammary cancer, except those given coconut oil, 
when the researchers analyzed the tissues uh, under the microscope, detailed and anal analysts, they could find no trace of cancer, even though the animals were given very potent cancer-causing chemicals. In another study with skin cancer, researchers applied chemical or uh, cancer-causing chemicals on the skin of test animals. Within weeks, the animals started developing tumors. However, if they applied coconut oil also on the skin, no tumors developed. So these next, these studies and others show that coconut oil potentially can help protect against co colon cancer, breast cancer, skin cancer, and other forms of cancer. Next, Coconut oil has shown to protect animals from cancer-causing chemicals that are applied on their skin and put into their food, which suggests that coconut oil can also help protect us against cancer-causing chemicals that may be in our environment or in our foods as well. Next. Next. This is a melanoma. Melanoma is the most deadly form of skin cancer. It causes death in one out of every four cases. Coconut oil was applied topically about three or four times a week. Next, within three months, it started shrinking like that. Next, in about a year, disappeared almost just to a, about a freckle. There they are side by side just by using coconut oil and no other treatment, and only topically. Next, this is my friend Julie. Julie was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, the most serious kind. Her cancer was so aggressive that it spread throughout her body, including into her spine and up into her brain. Doctors tried to remove surgically as much as they could, but they couldn't get into her spine or into her brain to remove it all. Uh, chemotherapy uh, was useless. The cancer continued to grow and get worse. And they gave up. There was nothing else they could do. They said she had two months left to live and sent her home and said, get your affairs in order. You've got two months to do it. Well, she went home, but she thought, you know, I'm not ready to die yet. So she started investigating alternative forms of cancer treatment. And she ran across coconut oil. And so she started eating coconut oil every day. Well, time went on, and her two months was coming. And as two months came, she was still alive. So she said, all right, I'll just continue eating my coconut oil. So she continued to eat her coconut oil. Two more months came and left. She was still alive. So she continued with her coconut oil. Two more months came and went. So she's continued with her coconut oil, but by this time, the doctors were getting concerned, you know. <laughs> she hadn't died yet. What's happening here? So they contacted her and said, hey, come down to the clinic. So she went down to the clinic, and they examined her. They could find no trace of the cancer. Her cancer in her spine, in her brain. totally gone. And that's not the end of the story. Once she was declared cancer-free, she joined a cancer support group with other cancer survivors. And she told the members of the group that she had cured her cancer with coconut oil. Now, you kind of imagine hearing this for the first time. Yeah, they thought this was really crazy. They called her the cocoa nut lady. Well, after a year, she was the only member of the group that was still alive. All the others had gotten cancer again and died. Now, there are other conditions, other non-infectious conditions that can be helped by coconut oil. Next, diabetes is one of these. Doctors will tell you or tell their diabetic patients to avoid fats, particularly saturated fats. However, Coconut oil is one fat the diabetic should definitely get in their diet and get ample amounts of it. And there are several reasons. 
for this. One, when you add coconut oil into a meal, it's going to slow down the absorption of sugar from that meal into your bloodstream. So it helps balance blood sugar levels. So diabetics, if they put coconut oil in every single meal, it's going to greatly improve blood sugar levels. Another is that the medium chain fatty acids in coconut oil are easily absorbed into our cells to produce energy. You don't need insulin, and it doesn't matter if you're insulin resistant, coconut oil or medium chain fatty acids will provide your cells with the energy it needs. And this is a big issue with type 2 diabetics because they can't absorb glucose effectively. Another is that medium, next, is that medium chain, and the next one after that, the medium chain fatty acids improve insulin secretion, next, and insulin sensitivity. So most diabetics are insulin resistant. Coconut oil helps improve insulin sensitivity. For these reasons, coconut oil can help prevent and even reverse many symptoms associated with diabetes. One of the most common symptoms is the loss of circulation and feeling, particularly in the feet and the lower legs. After the publication of my book, The Coconut Oil Miracle, I got a call from a man who had read the book. He was a diabetic. And he said that he had lost all the feeling in his feet due to poor circulation caused by his diabetes. It was only a matter of time before he'd eventually uh, need amputation next because that's one of the consequences of poor circulation is gangrene. And then you'd have to come in and amputate the feet, the toes. It was only a matter of time before he reached this stage. So after reading my book, he started taking coconut oil. He'd taken it for two weeks. He said, my feet came alive. The circulation in his feet improved to the point that feeling returned to his feet. He would no longer was under the threat of having his feet amputated. Since that time, many other diabetics have contacted me with almost identical stories to this. For example, one man said his feet had been numb for six years. It started in his big toe and slowly worked down his foot. Now it was coming up his leg, this numbness. He received a small cut on his lower uh, leg and because of poor circulation, the cut refused to heal. And it persisted for months without showing any signs of healing. Well, he started eating three to four tablespoons of coconut oil a day. He said within 10 days, the cut was completely healed and feeling had returned to his feet in 10 days. Another man said that his wife and daughter are diabetics and they monitor their blood sugar levels at least three times a day. When they eat the wrong type of foods and their blood sugar levels get a little bit high, they no longer inject themselves with insulin. Instead, what they do is they eat two to three tablespoons of coconut oil, and within 30 minutes, their blood sugar levels are back down to normal. I don't know of any drug or any herb or any supplement that can reverse diabetic symptoms as well as coconut oil can. Next, if I asked you what disease would, do you dread the most, what d disease um, is the most terrifying to you, what would you say? I would too. And the good reason for that, because it's a terrifying d disease, it takes away, you know, um, our identity, our personality. It's characterized by failing memory, erratic behaviors, a loss of control of bodily functions. Each year, 260,000 Americans are diagnosed with dementia. Alzheimer's by far the most common form of dementia. Next, one in eight people over the age of 65 and half those over the age of 85 have Alzheimer's disease in the United States. 
Most cases of Alzheimer's usually surface after the age of 60, but sometimes they can occur in a person's 40s or 50s. This is called early onset Alzheimer's. You know, it's bad enough to get Alzheimer's in old age, but to get it in midlife can be devastating. Of the 5.3 million Americans next who have Alzheimer's, next, A half a million of them have early onset Alzheimer's. And another 600,000 people under the age of 64 have mild cognitive impairment, which is a precursor or the beginning stages of Alzheimer's. Next, as you age, your risk of Alzheimer's increases. The older you live, the more likely you're, you're going to get the disease. Age is the greatest risk factor for Alzheimer's. However, age does not cause Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is a disease just like diabetes or just like cancer. The brains of Alzheimer's patients are very different from the brains of elderly people who age normally. Alzheimer's patients' brains have a high degree of degeneration and damage. And people can and do live long, healthy lives without ever encountering Alzheimer's. Now, Alzheimer's is considered a terminal illness. It's the seventh leading cause of death in the United States. Some statistics have it down to the third leading cause of death. Doctors don't have a clue how to stop it or how to prevent it. They can't even agree on what causes it. Current medicines next used to treat Alzheimer's can't stop it, let alone reverse it. Studies have shown that the best they can do, the absolute best these drugs can do, is slow down the progression of the disease a little bit. Studies show that this effect is so small, so tiny, that it makes absolutely no difference in a person's day-to-day -day activities. And it only has an effect in half of the patients that even try it. And in those that do have an effect, it wears off in six months to a year. So that after one year, there's actually no effect at all to 100% of the patients that take these drugs. Now, when you consider the uh, side effects that are associated with these, with these drugs, which include nausea, headaches, dizziness, hallucinations, mental confusion, muscle wasting, seizures, and death. You gotta think, is it really worth it for no perceivable benefit? You know, and doctors are aware of this. They know that most of the patients don't benefit from these drugs. They know that none of their patients benefit after one year. Yet, they continue to prescribe these medications year after year after year till the patient dies. Why is that? Well, the reason is because they don't have anything else to offer. These drugs is, are all they have. Medical science has failed completely when it comes to the treatment of Alzheimer's. Now, conventional medical wisdom considers Alzheimer's to be incurable. But simply because there isn't a drug that can successfully treat it doesn't mean that it's hopeless. There is a successful treatment for Alzheimer's, and it doesn't involve drugs, doesn't involve surgery, doesn't involve any type of medical treatment. It's based on diet, and the key to this diet is coconut. Next. Particularly, uh, next, particularly coconut oil. A coconut oil-based diet has proven to be successful in not only stopping the progression of the disease, but reversing it and, in some cases, completely eliminating the disease. Now, the success of the treatment depends on the, the um, degree of disease, how long a person has had it, and how closely they file, follow the treatment protocol. Now, over the years, many people have contacted me and have told me how coconut oil has helped them with various, or their, or their family, with various neurological problems, like Parkinson's disease, or uh, traumatic brain injury, or 
MS or epilepsy or ADHD or Alzheimer's disease. A few years ago, I was contacted by a, God, a doctor from Florida by the name of Mary Newport. And she explained to me how she was successful in treating her Alzheimer's husband using coconut oil. Next. His name was Steve. This is Steve Newport. He started developing Alzheimer's at the age of 53, so he had early onset Alzheimer's, but at this point he had had Alzheimer's for about five and a half years. He had been an accountant, very good with numbers and calculating. His wife actually described him as a computer whiz because he could take a computer apart, fix it, and put it together again, which baffled her, and she was a, you know, a doctor. But he lost all of that. He lost the ability to read, to type on a computer keyboard. He couldn't even spell simple three-letter words like out, O-U-T, or fun, F-U-N. He lost that ability. He was losing the ability to even remember family members' names. He couldn't dress himself properly. He would put shoe and sock on one foot and go around barefoot on the other foot every day, all day long. Now, Dr. Newport, being a doctor, when her husband started getting these symptoms, she put him on all the medications available, and he went through the whole gamut. And they did no good whatsoever. He got getting worse and worse and worse. And so she was getting desperate. And so she started looking for experimental drugs, new drugs that were being developed. And they were looking for uh, participants. And she wanted to sign Steve up to be one of these participants of these experimental drugs. And as she was looking for a promising drug, she found one that showed particular promise. This drug in preliminary studies had shown that after one dose showed that Alzheimer's pa patients actually showed improvement. This had never, ever been done before. Remember, all that Alzheimer's drugs currently can do is slow down the degeneration. None of them can stop of it. None of them can reverse it. This drug actually showed improvement. So she wanted to sign him up for this study. So they went down to enroll him. And when they went down, uh, Steve was given a test next called the Mini Mental State Exam, or MMSE test. This is a basic test given to Alzheimer's patients to determine what level of dementia they are at. There's 30 questions in it, and the questions uh, vary. For example, some of the questions would be like, um, what day of the week is it? What city are you in? Uh, most of them are fairly simple like that. And so if you can answer or the patient can answer 25 to 30 correct, that was considered normal. 20 to 24 would be, indicate mild dementia. 19 to 11 would be moderate dementia. Anything less than 10 would indicate severe dementia. So Steve took the test. He scored a 12, almost in the severe range. He scored so poorly, he was rejected from the study. He was considered hopeless. Even their new miracle wonder drug couldn't help Steve, and so they were sent home. Well, Dr. Newport had done a lot of research on this new drug, and in her research, she actually came across the patent application for this drug. And in this application, it contained all the theory and logic of why and how this drug worked. It also contained preliminary studies, both animal and human studies, showing how it worked, and interestingly enough, it contained the formula for the drug. So she knew exactly what was in it, and it only contained one active ingredient, and that ingredient was medium chain fatty acids derived from coconut oil. Well, she couldn't get her hands on this drug because it was still experimental, but she sure could get her hands on coconut oil. So she went down to her local health food store and bought a jar of virgin coconut oil. She brought it home. She calculated how much coconut oil she'd have to give Steve in order to equal the amount of medium chain fatty acids they were using in the study. It came to two and a half tablespoons. So the next day, she gave him two and a half tablespoons in his oatmeal in the morning. 
This was two weeks after he was rejected from the study, okay? Now, that afternoon, they had an appointment with a neurologist. So he went to the study, or to the appointment, and the neurologist had Steve retake the MMSE test. Now, remember, two weeks before, he scored a 12. This time, he took it. He scored an 18. This is unheard of. Alzheimer's patients don't spontaneously improve from a 12 to an 18. This is probably the first time this is ever done in the history of mankind, such an improvement with Alzheimer's disease. They were shocked at the improvement, and they realized they had discovered something incredible. Also, something very important happened at the same time, or very interesting. The day before he started taking the coconut oil, he had another appointment with a doctor, with a different doctor. And in this test, or in this appointment, he had took another test. Next, the test was called a clock test. This is another standard test that they have dementia patients take to determine their level of dementia. And in this test, the doctor has the patient draw the face of a clock, like there, by memory, by heart. And so Steve drew the clock next, and this is what his version of the, of the clock. His mind was so far gone, he didn't even remember what a clock looked like. When the doctor looked at that, he told the Newports, Steve was now entering the severe stages of Alzheimer's. Well, the next day, he started on the coconut oil regime. And he started taking the two and a half tablespoons every day. He retook the clock test after two weeks. Next. Vast improvement. The only change he had was taking the coconut oil. Two and a half weeks later, he retook the test again. Next. It's actually looking like a clock now. The only thing that's changed was he's eating coconut oil. Next. This is Dr. Newport and her husband and the clock test. Well, over the next year, he continued to take his coconut. In fact, they increased the amount of coconut oil he was taking every day. And he started improving, getting better and better and better. He started dressing himself properly. He could remember family members' names. He could, he regained the ability to read and to type on the computer keyboard. In fact, he would go to the computer, boot up, log on, and surf the internet all on his own. This is someone who was diagnosed with severe Alzheimer's just a few months earlier. He took the MMSE test again. He scored a 20. This is in the mild range. He was now in the mild. He had reversed the Alzheimer's into the mild range. Steve said that before he took coconut oil, it was like he was locked in a dark room without any windows, no lights. And then when he started taking coconut oil, it's like someone turned on the light. He could see again. He could think clearly again. He stated that with coconut oil, I got my life back. In fact, he was feeling so good that he volunteered his services at the hospital where his wife was employed, working in the shipping and receiving department. That's how much he improved. Now, many people, other people with Alzheimer's, have followed their footsteps, have added coconut oil into their diet, and have shown remarkable improvements. You can go on the internet and you can go look at YouTube and see a lot of people's testimonies on there. Some of them who claim that their Alzheimer's were totally reversed using coconut oil. Now, some people think, wow, it's really too incredible to believe that something as easy as adding coconut oil into a diet can reverse a disease like Alzheimer's. So I want to spend just a couple of minutes um, talking about how and why coconut oil does work because there is a scientific foundation. It's not mumbo jumbo. There's science. There's a reason why. So to, under, to, 
understand how medium chain fatty acids affect Alzheimer's, we need to understand what's going on in the Alzheimer's brain. Medical research has shown that Alzheimer's is actually a form of diabetes, brain diabetes. Next, it is now referred to next as type 3 diabetes. Alzheimer's is type 3 diabetes. Diabetes is caused by a defect in blood sugar metabolism. When you eat a meal, much of the food is converted into glucose or blood sugar and sent into our bloodstream. Our cells absorb the glucose, and this is what they use for fuel, for energy. However, the cells cannot absorb the glucose without the hormone insulin. Insulin uh, next unlocks the door on the cell membrane next on the cell membrane that allows insulin to come into the cell. Insulin is absolutely essential. You have to have insulin. Your bloodstream could be saturated with glucose, but if you don't have insulin there, none of it can get into your cells. So you have to have insulin. There are two major types of diabetes. Type 1 is when the body can't produce an adequate amount of insulin. In type 2 diabetes, the body may be able to produce a normal amount of insulin, but the cells have become unresponsive or resistant to the action. This is called insulin resistance. 90 to 95 percent of diabetics are type 2 diabetics, insulin resistant. Insulin resistant diabetics are at very high risk of developing Alzheimer's. In Alzheimer's disease, the brain has become insulin resistant. It cannot absorb glucose efficiently. Therefore, the brain cells begin to starve, degenerate, and die. And as the brain cells begin to die, the brain begins to shrink, and the patient begins to lose cognitive ability, memory, and even personality. Glucose is the primary source of energy used by all the cells in the body. And if you don't eat for, and we get most of our glucose from the carbohydrates, okay, in our diet. And if we don't eat for a while, say between meals, while we're sleeping, or if we're fasting, then our blood glucose levels start to come down. But our cells need a continual supply of energy 24 hours a day. So when blood glucose levels start coming down, they need another source of fuel. This fuel comes from stored body fat. The body mobilizes its stored fat and releases fatty acids from storage. Our cells can use fatty acids just like they do glucose to produce energy. So in this manner, our cells, the cells in our body, have access to either glucose or fatty acids 24 hours a day. Now, this process works good for the body, but not for the brain. The brain cannot use fatty acids to supply its energy needs, so it needs an alternative source of energy. That alternative source, next, is known as ketones or ketone bodies. Ketones are super potent uh, forms of fuel that are produced in the liver specifically to feed the brain. Now, most all the cells in your body can use ketones, but they're made specifically for the brain. So what happens next is that between meals, when blood sugar levels are low, the liver starts cranking out ketones and blood ketone levels rise. When you eat a meal, next, the liver stops producing ketones, blood glucose levels rise, and ketone levels come down. So in this manner, the brain always has access to either glucose or ketones 24 hours a day to supply its energy needs. Now, ketones are known as super fuel for the brain. Next, because they provide much more energy than glucose. It's kind of like putting 
uh, super performance gasoline into your car, you get better gas mileage, uh, more power with less wear and tear. Ketones have an, a similar effect on our brains. In Alzheimer's disease, the brain cannot absorb glucose effectively. However, the brain can absorb ketones. The Alzheimer's brain can easily absorb ketones. Ketones are not affected by insulin resistance. So the ketones can diffuse into the brain cell and provide the brain with the energy it needs. So in Alzheimer's, when you have high blood glucose levels, the brain is starving for energy and slowly dying. When glucose is low and ketones are high, the brain is actually able to get energy to keep it alive and going. Now there's four main things that ketones can do for the brain. Next one is they provide a high potency alternative fuel to glucose. Glu ketones are actually essential for brain survival. Even in people without Alzheimer's, you need ketones coming in your brains because your blood glucose levels are always fluctuating. And when it's down, you need ketones coming into your brains too to provide your brain with energy. Number two, they increase blood flow to the brain, improving circulation and oxygen delivery to your brain. Number three, they trigger the activation of certain proteins called brain-derived neurotrophic factors in the brain that regulate brain cell growth, repair, and function, and actually stimulate the healing process and the processes that calm inflammation, which is a characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. So they can calm inflammation. They stimulate repair. And fourth, they provide the basic lipid building blocks for new brain cells. Did you know that much of your brain is made from ketones? During the third trimester of pregnancy and during the first few months of life, this period of time is known as the brain growth spurt period. This is when your brain grows the most that will grow throughout your entire life. During this period of time, the fetus and the newborn infant is in a state of ketosis or high blood ketones. And those ketones are necessary to provide the building blocks for the infant's brain. And even as an adult, your brain cells are dying and new brain cells are growing and you need basic building blocks to rebuild those brains, and ketones provide those building blocks. This is so important, I wanna briefly go through those again. Next. So the steps, you know, they provide a high potency fuel, 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 they improve oxygen delivery, they activate the processes of healing and repair, and provide the building blocks for new brain tissue. For these reasons, ketones can have a very pronounced effect on brain health and can be used therapeutically to treat brain disorders. Now, ketone therapy is nothing new. Ketones have been used therapeutically for 90 years to treat brain disorders. Back in the early 1900s, doctors used fasting therapy to treat hard-to-treat conditions. And one of the conditions that fasting therapy worked very well on was epilepsy. When a doctor would put a patient on a fast for 20 to 30 days, consuming nothing but water, it would greatly reduce seizures with long-lasting results. It would last for years. The reason for this is that on a fast, your glucose levels are low and your body's cranking out ketones the whole time and it's relying very heavily on ketones for its energy, particularly the brain. And so on a fast, your brain has access to ketones 24 hours a day, day after day after day, as long as you hold on to that fast. And so you've got this therapeutic effect. And doctors have noted that the longer they could keep a patient on a fast, the better the outcome. Now, the problem with this is there's only a limit on how long you can keep a patient on a fast. And so they devised a diet that could mimic the therapeutic effects of fasting 
while still allowing enough nutrients to uh, maintain good health long term. And this diet is called the ketogenic diet. Next. The ketogenic diet proved very successful in treating even the most uh, severe forms of drug re uh, resistant epilepsy. And because it was so successful with epilepsy, doctors began experimenting with other types of brain conditions like Parkinson's disease, uh, ALS, Huntington's disease, traumatic brain injuries, uh, stroke, and Alzheimer's disease. In every single case, the ketogenic diet proved successful in improving brain function. Now, with a classic ketogenic diet, carbohydrate intake is reduced to about 2% uh, of calories. And this is necessary to bring blood glucose levels down and to generate therapeutic levels of ketones in the body. Typically, we consume about 60% of our calories is carbohydrate. So when you reduce that to just 2%, you need to replace it with some other t type of energy nutrient. And in the ketogenic diet, it's replaced with fat. Fatty acids provide the basic building blocks for ketones. Now, the drawback to this is that preparing and eating meals consisting of 85 to 90% fat is difficult. It's a challenge. And this is why the ketogenic diet hasn't been used uh, more often for treatment of Alzheimer's. Next, but this is where ketones or coconut oil comes in. Coconut ketones. When you eat coconut oil, a portion of the medium chain fatty acids that you eat will automatically be converted into ketones regardless of blood ketone levels and regardless of what other foods are in your diet. You can raise blood levels of ketones to therapeutic levels simply by eating coconut oil. So in a sense, with adequate amount of coconut oil, any diet can become a ketogenic therapeutic diet. So now, I'm kind of running short on time. There, is a, there was an interesting study I want to talk to you about just briefly, in which they studied the medium chain fatty acids in coconut oil on patients. So this isn't all just uh, theory or just stories. They're actual studies. And in this study, they took a group of, of patients, Alzheimer's patients, and they divided them in half. And one half, they gave a beverage that contained medium chain uh, fatty acids, and the other half they gave them a beverage that contained the typical long chain fatty acids. After they gave them that drink, 90 minutes later, they subjected them to a series of cognitive and memory uh, tests. And they found that those patients that had eaten the beverage that contained medium chain fatty acids scored significantly higher on the test than the others. Now, this study was extremely significant for three major reasons. One is it proved scientifically that medium chain fatty acids can reverse the symptoms of Alzheimer's. Keep in mind that no drug has ever been able to do this. This study proved that coconut oil could do that. Second, it showed that this effect was seen almost immediately. Within 90 minutes, the patients were scoring better. And third, this effect was seen after one dose. They didn't take, have to take 100 doses. They didn't have to take it for six months. After one dose, they had an immediate benefit improvement in Alzheimer's symptoms. So, how much coconut oil do you need? Well, for day-to-day, -day, for prevention, I'm, anyone in here interested in preventing Alzheimer's? I would think anyone. <laughs> I would recommend 
two to three tablespoons a day. But for treating Alzheimer's, I would recommend at least five tablespoons a day. Now, I go into great detail in that next and explain how to use coconut oil. Next, how to use coconut oil. And, you know, it's just not adding coconut oil into your... That's the study that I was talking about. Next. But you need to do it with a proper diet. And you also need to avoid certain things in the diet and in your environment that promotes Alzheimer's. So there are definite things in our everyday environment. Some things in the foods that you buy in the store promote Alzheimer's. Some things that people eat every single day without realizing they're damaging, they're killing brain cells. And there's certain drugs that also kill brain cells and promote Alzheimer's. And this is all explained in my book that was just um, on, on the screen there. And I'm see, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to quickly go over the next few because I want to leave time for the demonstration. I know, that's why I'm hurrying up. Next. So I've been... Um, I'm kind of next, next, and next, next, and next, and next. I'm running out of time. So there are other, if you want the details and all that, it's in my book, okay? <laughs> but there's other products. I've talked about coconut oil. I haven't even talked about all the benefits of coconut oil. I've just talked about some of the major benefits with some of the major health problems. But there's a lot of health conditions that coconut oil can help with. And I've got other books on that. But there are other... Coconut products, coconut milk is one. Next, coconut milk looks like regular milk. Next, it looks like, you know, it's creamy and thick and rich. And um, the one of the benefits with coconut milk is it has a high percentage of coconut oil in it. So you don't always have to eat coconut oil. You can eat coconut milk. And coconut milk is nice because you can use it as a replacement for dairy milk. For, so in any recipe that you have that calls for cream or milk, you can use coconut milk in that. So it widens out the variety of foods and the um, experience you can have of getting coconut oil into your body. Next. Now, coconut, oil, coconut milk is not sweet. Lots of people who haven't tasted it before think that it's sweet, but it's neutral. And so you can use it to make all types of foods, including savory foods like soups and stews. Next, um, next, casseroles. Again, where you'd use milk. Next, and cream and things. You can use you can use it for salad dressings. Next, next. If you want to add in some sweetening to it, you can also make desserts, uh, coconut cream pies. Next, you can even make puddings. And next and even ice cream out of 100% coconut milk. So if you're allergic to, to dairy milk or you want to avoid that, or if you just want to have the benefits of the coconut oil that's naturally in it, you can eat these type of ingredients. Next. Now, lots of people, they'll read my books, they say, okay, I'm convinced. I want to add coconut oil into my diet, but how? How do I incorporate my everyday diet? If I'm going to get three or four or five tablespoons into my diet, how do I do that? So I wrote a book called the Coconut Oil, uh, or called the Coconut Lovers uh, Cookbook. And it contains over 400 recipes describing how to use coconut oil and coconut milk uh, in your everyday diet. So it makes it easy to get coconut oil in your diet. Next. We also have coconut meat. Next. Of course, you're familiar with the fresh coconut and the coconut meat. Next. And then there's the uh, shredded coconut you can buy in the store. Next. There's also another product called coconut flour. Coconut flour is coconut meat that has been dehydrated, defatted, and ground into a fine powder. And you can use it just like you do other flours. Next. To make bread products and such. The good thing about coconut flour is that it's gluten-free. Lots of people now are trying to get away from gluten or they want to get away from wheat. This is a perfect avenue to do that. You can use coconut flour and have it totally gluten-free. And another benefit is it's high in fiber. So we're always being told by nutritionists we need to increase our fiber content so it provides a high fiber, gluten-free, uh, even a low-carb source of breads and baked goods. Next. And so you can make breads. Next. 
and muffins and cakes and things like that from coconut flour. Next. Another product is coconut water. Next. You've probably heard a lot about coconut water because it's becoming very popular right now as a sports rehydration beverage. Coconut water is not the same as coconut milk. When you go into the store and you grab a coconut and you shake it, that sloshing you sound is coconut water. It is not coconut milk. Coconut water and milk are totally different. Coconut milk is a manufactured product. And the way you manufacture it is to get coconut meat and crush it. And the juice that comes out of the meat is coconut milk. It's the white, creamy stuff. Coconut water is fat-free, so it has no coconut oil in it. But it's good in itself, next, because it has other health benefits. You can get it straight from a coconut like that, next. Or you can get it from a variety of containers that you can get at any store, health food store, regular grocery store, at the gym, anywhere. Next. A lot of sports people are now using it. Athletes are using it as a rehydration beverage. Next. It's being called nature's Gatorade, but it's far superior to Gatorade uh, as a rehydration beverage because Gatorade is basically just sugar water and salt. But coconut water has a full complement of um, electrolytes in it that are in our blood and in our body, so it replaces them more naturally. Next, there's a lot of health benefits. One of them is it's low in sugar. Compare that to other juices and beverages, about a third of the amount of sugar. Next, also documented uh, health benefits associated with coconut water. Helps with heat stroke, constipation, high blood pressure. Helps dissolve kidney stones. Helps uh, with the urinary tract infections. Next, helps with uh, protect against heart disease. Uh, even eye problems, malnutrition, even has anti-cancer problems. Some of the early research was anti-cancer research that we learned about all these health benefits. It even has anti-aging you know, properties. Documented, scientifically documented anti-aging uh, properties to it. It's really kind of amazing where they've, they've had cells, human cells, and have they actually stopped the aging process. Well, next... I have a book called Coconut Water for Health and Healing, which goes into detail on these because I don't have enough time to explain the anti-aging properties, the anti-cancer properties that are all associated with coconut water, but you can find it in there. Next. And if you want more, learn more about coconut, come to the Coconut Research Center next. And you'll learn, like they do in the Philippines, to... A coconut day keeps the doctor away. Now, I will give the time <laughs> to my wife. <laughs> Thank you.